1997, a drug called finasteride was approved for the use of male pattern baldness at a milligram a day. It was touted as a miracle drug for those suffering with hair loss and was the savior, the calvary if you will, for men deep in the trenches of aggressively progressing baldness. Pharmaceutical companies are great marketers. Though they have been forced to explain a degree of the side effects that come from their drugs, the overarching message is this will reduce your symptoms and give you a better quality of life. So people bite, and men did. The excitement of being able to take a pill a day and keep the hair transplant doctor away swayed many young, unsuspecting men to start taking the drug. And a lot of those men had great success, but some men didn't. In fact, a little known set of side effects that Merck, one of the major manufacturers of finasteride knew about but tried to obfuscate, had started to permeate throughout the web. Over the ensuing decades, men from all around the world started reporting some troubling side effects that they were having from finasteride. The most abundant among them, severe erectile dysfunction and a catastrophic muting of sexual desire, coupled with significant depression and suicidal ideation. Out of this collective, underreported contingent of men birthed the term post-finasteride syndrome. But why? How could a simple hair loss prevention drug cause these side effects? The answer is quite simple. An inhibition of the pathway of the conversion of testosterone into the most masculinizing sexual organ development and maintenance androgen called DHT limits bioavailability of DHT, forcing an upregulation of the pathway of testosterone's conversion into estradiol or estrogen. Estradiol is critical for cardiac, joint, brain, and sexual health for men. But is there a threshold? Actually, yes, there is. In a 2019 study titled The Association Between Elevated Serum Estradiol Levels and Clinically Significant Erectile Dysfunction in Men Presenting for Andrological Evaluation, a blood level of 32 picograms per milliliter of serum estrogen was deemed the cutoff point after which men were more susceptible to experience erectile dysfunction. In that study, they found that a higher proportion of those with high serum E2 or estrogen had clinically significant erectile dysfunction. And we actually have a clinically conclusive mechanism by which this happens, vascular endothelial growth factor at penile tissue triggering venous occlusive disorder and leakage of blood from the penile veins causing erectile dysfunction. Doing any degree of diligence in the forums of men that are on testosterone replacement therapy, which when not managed correctly can result in markedly elevated levels of estrogen, you'd find that a lot of men on testosterone because of this elevation in estrogen are experiencing erectile and libido dysfunction. If it was just as simple as keeping estrogen in a tight range, men on finasteride could just block estrogen to an extent and not run into side effects. Except this isn't true. For proper erectile function, libido, and continued masculinization of a man, he needs adequate levels of the most potent androgen we make in our body with an innate established pathway of 5 alpha reduction called dihydrotestosterone or DHT. In an article written by Dr. Andre Theodore Guay, an established endocrinologist who served as the chair of the Department of Endocrinology as well as the director of the Endocrinology Fellowship Program and the founder and director of the Center for Sexual Function called Testosterone and Erectile Physiology, it was determined that in castrated rats, the relative importance of testosterone and dihydrotestosterone for erectile function has been tested. By implanting castrated rats with celastic implants containing testosterone or DHT, with or without daily injections of the 5-alpha reductase inhibitor finasteride, it was shown that the erectile response was evident with testosterone without finasteride, and with DHT with or without finasteride, but not with testosterone plus finasteride. DHT is therefore the active androgen in the restoration of erectile function in castrated animals. The article goes on to say that in summary, the effects of testosterone on erectile function depend initially upon the conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. The activity of DHT is then mediated by an endothelial dependent mechanism. It does also state that, however, other non-endothelial dependent mechanisms are also responsible for the restoration of erectile function by testosterone, which makes sense. Both testosterone and dihydrotestosterone are critically important for erectile function in men. It's not just one or the other. Now, Dr. Guai is actually more important than you think because he has a history of studying the effects of preventing the conversion of testosterone to DHT by inhibiting the 5-alpha reductase enzymes, which is the main mechanism of finasteride. In a paper titled, 5-alpha reductase inhibitors alter steroid metabolism and may contribute to insulin resistance, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and vascular disease, a medical hypothesis, the abstract reads the following. 5-alpha reductases, a unique family of enzymes with a wide host of substrates and tissue distributions, play a key role in the metabolism of androgens, 
progestins, mineral corticoids, and glucocorticoids. These enzymes are the rate-limiting step in the synthesis of a host of neurosteroids, which are critical for central nervous system function. Androgens and glucocorticoids modulate mitochondrial function, carbohydrate, protein, and lipid metabolism, and energy balance. Thus, the inhibition of these regulatory enzymes results in an imbalance in steroid metabolism and clearance rates, which leads to altered physiological processes. In this report, we advance the hypothesis that the inhibition of 5-alpha reductases by finasteride and dutasteride alters not only steroid metabolism, but also interferes with the downstream actions and signaling of these hormones. We suggest that finasteride and dutasteride inhibit 5-alpha reductase activities and reduce the clearance of glucocorticoids and mineral corticoids, potentiating insulin resistance, diabetes, and vascular disease. Did Dr. Andre Guay predict the alarming rates of depression that would come to be in men taking finasteride via exposing the mechanism of the inhibition of DHT's critical neurosteroid cascade via the muting of 5-alpha reductase. Because yes, that's a thing too. In addition to erectile dysfunction and a complete shutdown of the male libido or sexual desire, finasteride has the tendency in susceptible individuals to induce a particularly sinister type of depression, the type that leads to suicidal ideation. On the morning of March 5th, 2013, about 45 minutes before his wife got home, John Pfaff stepped onto the railroad tracks a block away and into the path of a southbound Amtrak train. He was killed on impact. Now, why would an otherwise happy individual with a family who was a successful executive in the IT field decide to jump in front of a train and end his life? As it turns out, John was taking Propecia, the primary name for the drug, Finasteride. John started suffering with sullen, dark thoughts in a persistently depressed mood and had suddenly lost all interest in sex with his wife, Kelly. When she confronted John about the situation regarding their sexual life, asking if John was having an affair, he responded denying the allegations and said to her in a very definitive way, something's just not right down there. But here's the critical part. Suspecting that finasteride was the reason for his depression and severe sexual dysfunction, John actually quit the drug, but that didn't help. In fact, John got worse. He lashed out at his children, started talking about taking his own life, and on the morning of March 5th, 2013, John committed suicide. As it turns out, a metabolite of DHT, the potent androgen that finasteride inhibits, called 3-alpha androstenediol, modulates GABA activity in the brain, leading to an activation of GABA-A receptors through positive allosteric modulation, which in neurobiology refers to the activation of a receptor without downregulating it. What Dr. Andre Guay elucidated is one of the probable mechanisms by which finasteride causes severe depression in men, specifically through the suppression of a critical DHT metabolite that heavily influences GABA-A receptor activity in the brain. Dr. Guay ended up passing away in the recent years, but I don't think he nor his colleagues recognized how important his research was and how it would affect countless men swayed into using the hair loss drug finasteride. John's situation is but one publicly available testimony about the severely deleterious effects of finasteride in men. It was brought to the public light in an article by Reuters, an established worldwide investigative journalism organization, titled Court Let Merck Hide Secrets About a Popular Drug's Risks, in which John's wife Kelly, and ultimately 1,100 other people, contended in a lawsuit filed in 2015 that Merck knew about the more than statistically significant erectile and depression side effects that could come about from taking their drug, finasteride. But in typical pharmaceutical company form, Merck denied the allegations vehemently. The article states, Merck has denied the allegations in court filings and declined to comment further on Pfaff's case. In a statement to Reuters, Merck said that it stands behind the safety and efficacy of Propecia, noting that the drug has been prescribed safely to millions of men since the late 1990s, while the drug's label still lists erectile dysfunction and other sexual problems as possible side effects among a small percentage of men, the company rejects allegations that Propecia causes those problems to persist after men stop taking it, or that it could lead to mental health issues. Merck says the symptoms themselves could be caused by a variety of other factors. Is this not a classic example of medical gaslighting? Is it not a complete deflection from the known side effects of finasteride reported by tens of thousands of men all across the world with Merck arrogantly contending that these symptoms were caused by other factors? Factors other than the drug that we know inhibits DHT systemically, leading to a plausible dysregulation of the GABAergic mediation of excitatory neurotransmitters, as well as severe tissue deficiency in the most powerful androgen for human male penile function and sexual activity? 
what other factors? Because scientifically speaking, with the inhibition of 5-alpha reductase and a marked drop in DHT, we have a smoking gun, both for the depression and the sexual disturbances found in men taking finasteride. In the prior stated lawsuit, it was determined through internal company communications that Merck knew 20 whole years prior to the lawsuit that finasteride caused sexual disturbances in men. This is what actually prompted the warnings of sexual dysfunction and depression to be put on the labels of the drug finasteride. Merck, now forced to reluctantly acknowledge these side effects, still contends that these side effects go away into the latter years of taking the drugs and symptoms resolve. This is also not true. Merck obfuscated data for the label regarding some men in their trials that had dropped out of the studies for sexual dysfunction. And guess when they dropped out of the studies? in the latter period of the five-year study. In other words, the men who stayed on finasteride into the latter years of the study who had sexual dysfunction were excluded from the data reporting, allowing Merck to falsely claim that the sexual side effects go away down the road after one has been taking finasteride for a while. Quoting from the Reuters article, Dr. Michael Erwig, an endocrinology professor at George Washington University who has studied Propecia, reviewed the faulty redacted court filing for Reuters. He said Merck's numbers look much better by excluding men who dropped out, and the difference reflects an overall lack of transparency regarding subjects who experience sexual side effects. In 2008, after Swedish regulators investigated reports that sexual side effects continued in men after they stopped taking the drug, Merck changed Propecia's label in that country to warn that erectile dysfunction had been reported to persist after stopping the drug. So what do we actually have here? We have a more finer tooth combed approach at Merck's data which refutes both claims Merck has made that sexual dysfunction resolves after some time on the drug and that no sexual dysfunction persists after stopping taking the drug. This prompted Merck to now include, only in the country of Sweden, that sexual symptoms can persist long after stopping the drug. In the end, Merck was forced to tell the truth, reluctantly, and sexual side effects do persist after taking finasteride. This is true. But let's step back into dihydrotestosterone, or DHT. There's no way of knowing how you're going to react uh, when you take this drug. It can completely ruin your life overnight. I took one pill two and a half years ago and, and nothing has gotten better. This is a video from the PFS network, part of the forum Propecia Help, where thousands upon thousands of men report their sexual and mental health side effects from taking finasteride. And what I found in my client work, working with these exhausted, debilitated men who just want their lives back, is that synthetic DHT derivatives like Mesterolone or Proviron help them significantly to regain their confidence, masculinity, sexual health, erections, and libido. Across various forums about finasteride on the web, you're going to find that DHT derivatives like Proviron, like Primabolin, Masteron, even Oxandrolone in some cases, have significantly helped people to alleviate their symptoms of sexual dysfunction caused by finasteride. And so the real question is, like in the case of taking Proviron and people getting symptom relief, why would potent methylated DHT binding at the androgen receptor give people symptom relief? The answer to that question is that users are finally able to get DHT activity at the tissue and genetic level, modulating both the sexual system as well as the neurobiological systems that go awry from the use of finasteride. Specifically, users are able to gain and maintain intracavernosal penile pressure, have increased nitric oxide synthase levels, and therefore improved intrapenile blood flow dynamics, all mechanisms that are proven to reduce markedly in 5-alpha reductase inhibition treatment protocols. In a paper titled The Dark Side of 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, sexual dysfunction, high gleason grade prostate cancer, and depression, published in the Korean Neurological Association in 2014, the mechanism by which inhibition of testosterone's conversion to dihydrotestosterone causes sexual dysfunction was fully elucidated. In a section titled Adverse Effects of 5-alpha reductase inhibitors therapy on sexual function, the study reported that Castration of mature male animals resulted in reduced erectile function and treatment of castrated animals with testosterone or its 5-alpha reduced metabolite, 5-alpha DHT, reversed this effect. Administration of the 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, 17-beta testosterone carboxylic acid, blocked the stimulatory effects of testosterone propionate on erections in castrated rats. In other words, if you give castrated rats that have severe erectile dysfunction testosterone propionate, they have alleviation from their erectile dysfunction. 
But if you give them testosterone propionate, which is a fast acting ester of exogenous testosterone that will readily convert into dihydrotestosterone via 5-alpha reductase, with a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, the stimulatory effects on erectile quality are not seen. Administration of 5-alpha DHT with or without the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors restored sexual behavior in long-term castrated male rats and mice, suggesting a critical role for 5-alpha DHT in erectile physiology. Further animal studies showed castration resulted in 50% reduction in erectile response, which was reversed by testosterone treatment. However, treatment with testosterone together with finasteride did not restore the erectile response in castrated animals, suggesting that 5-alpha DHT or dihydrotestosterone is an important hormone in erectile physiology. Administration of 5-alpha DHT together with finasteride, however, restored nitric oxide synthase expression in activity and also restored the erectile response to electric field stimulation, confirming the role of this metabolite in erectile physiology. Castration in male rats eliminates non-contact erections and this response was restored by 5-alpha DHT implantation. Non-contact erections in animals are thought to be similar to psychogenic erections in humans. Reduced erectile response and reflex erections were observed in castrated animals, and treatment of castrated animals with testosterone or 5-alpha-DHT restored the number of erectile responses and reflex erections. However, only 5-alpha-DHT restored erectile responses and reflex erections when the animals were treated with daily injections of a 5-alpha-reductase inhibitor called MK434, together with testosterone or 5-alpha-DHT. These findings suggest that 5-alpha-DHT, or dihydrotestosterone, plays a key physiologic role in erectile physiology in the animal model, and 5-alpha-reductase inhibitors treatment are likely to produce sexual adverse effects on the erectile response. In more recent studies, it was demonstrated that the treatment of mature animals with dutasteride resulted in reduced serum DHT levels by 86.5% after 30 days. The intracavernosal pressure in the penis decreased significantly in animals treated with dutasteride. Similarly, EFS-induced and acetylcholine-induced penile smooth muscle relaxations were also significantly attenuated. More profoundly, connective tissue deposition was markedly increased in the corpus cavernosum of the dutasteride-treated animals. Concomitant with these changes are the markedly reduced expression of neuronal nitric oxide synthase and increased expression of the inducible nitric oxide, suggesting that dutasteride induces altered gene expression in the corpus cavernosum. This may hopefully give credence to some of the theories that the PFS people have that they've got altered gene expression from taking finasteride. It appears as if inhibiting 5-alpha reductase can alter gene expression in penile tissues. The effects of dutasteride on erectile function were investigated after six weeks of treatment followed by a washout period of two weeks. The ratio of intracavernosal penile pressure over mean arterial pressure and total ICP in the dutasteride treated animals were significantly decreased when compared to control animals. Even after a two week washout period, the effects persisted and the intracavernosal pressure was significantly reduced in the dutasteride treated animal, suggesting a persistent effect of the drug on erectile physiology. Also, the endothelium dependent smooth muscle relaxations were diminished in the dutasteride-treated animals. The author suggests that discontinuation of dutasteride did not restore erectile function, indicating a time-dependent detriment of dutasteride on erectile physiology. They cite another study within this study that I think is important for us to explore, which says the following. A recent study reported that the treatment of mature animals for 16 weeks with a daily oral dose of 4.5 milligrams per kilogram of finasteride significantly reduced 5-alpha DHT levels and attenuated penile erectile response to EFS of the cavernosal nerve. This treatment also reduced the trabecular smooth muscle content and increased connective tissue deposition, reminiscent of the data reported by other scientists in the castrated animal model. In addition, finasteride treatment reduced endothelial nitric oxide synthase expression. More importantly, this treatment decreased autophagy and produced deterioration in the ultrastructure of the corpus cavernosum, right? This is tissue in the penis, including mitochondrial injury and increased trabecular smooth muscle cell death. These findings together with the previously reported data from preclinical studies point out to the serious adverse effects of finasteride and dutasteride on the anatomy, physiology, and cell biology of erectile function and suggest that the effects of these drugs may be persistent 
or irreversible. Now, one would look at this evidence and confidently conclude that mitochondrial injury to the corpus cavernosum of the penis, downregulated nitric oxide synthase expression, mutated cell biology in erectile tissues, and reduced intracavernosal pressure induced by the inhibition of 5-alpha reductases action, converting testosterone to DHT, are the primary mechanisms of action that finasteride and similar 5-alpha reductase inhibitors induce erectile dysfunction in men. One would confidently conclude that as stated in the study, DHT is a critically important androgen in the function, maintenance, and optimization of penile tissues and function. And inhibiting DHT has grave consequences for sexual health in men, which is what we find when we examine the tens of thousands plus anecdotals on the web regarding people's experience with the drug finasteride. I mean, it's almost undeniable, right? Meaning you can't have consumed this literature and end up with a biased position that finasteride does not or cannot cause sexual dysfunction in men. I mean, that's just silly, isn't it? <laughs> Apparently not. He has taken a very strong interest in the subject of DHT and he recently uploaded a video titled, quote, DHT is a trash hormone, unquote. The title of this video would have been absolutely perfect if only he had replaced the question mark with a period or even an exclamation mark because DHT of course is a trash hormone as I have proven many many times. Post finasteride syndrome is of course not a real condition. It is an alt-right QAnon conspiracy theory that is popularly promoted on forums populated by incels, white nationalists, as well as flat earther and moon landing conspiracy theorists. This is Kevin Mann a YouTuber we can classify as a post-finasteride syndrome denier. Kevin contends that despite all this established research on finasteride's devastating effects on male sexual function, as well as DHT's critical role in male penile physiology, that DHT is a trash hormone. Finasteride doesn't cause sexual dysfunction, and that post-finasteride syndrome does not exist. Kevin's position is that the thousands upon thousands of men that are reporting sexual disturbances post-taking finasteride are all simply lying. People that are extremely biased about finasteride because it helped them to prevent hair loss and even catalyze regrowth of their hair, denying sexual disturbances that men are very clearly having while taking finasteride and post taking finasteride are dangerous. What's more critically alarming is the large quantity of cultish followers of the dangerous idea that finasteride is perfectly safe to use in all men who are angry, aggressive, trolling, and childishly obnoxious in their communications across social media platforms on the web. And though some of these individuals are stark supporters of Kevin and his pro-finasteride narrative, there are also some defectors who have wised up to his non-scientific, extremely biased ways. A user on one of the most popular forums for PFS sufferers called Propecia Help says the following after being one of Kevin's avid followers and subscribers to the narrative that finasteride is safe. I really think Kevin Mann's influence is underestimated. His fast Adderall and Few style of talking and complete narcissism will definitely attract a lot of viewers and his channel will grow. He knows the research on finasteride and cherry picks all the pharmaceutical marketing brochures to a young, naive audience. I was one of them. He looks impressive for his age until you start putting it all together. The steroid usage, the hair transplant, the antidepressants, the vegan diet, the grandiose narcissism, the video game addiction, the sociopathic tendencies. He is dangerous, and I don't even think he takes finasteride, seeing as he was against it a few years ago. So it seems that people do wise up, and there is hope for the individuals that follow his content that are tightly wound poised to attack people that challenge this narrative. But one other interesting tidbit that came out of that testimony was the fact that Kevin has in fact admitted that there are sexual side effects that can come from finasteride. And he did. Yes, the overly dogmatic, aggressively antagonistic, pro-finasteride PFS denier Kevin Mann once himself admitted that there were sexual disturbances in men who took finasteride. Have a look. Guys, I wanted to create this video to talk about a subject which uh, is a little bit new to this channel, but it's something that I have some experience with, and it also relates to the subject I usually tackle, which is hair loss, and that is the use of erectile dysfunction drugs. In particular, I want to talk about the use of these drugs in conjunction with uh, hair loss drugs and how they can be used to combat the side effects for those who do experience side effects with alpha-5 reductase inhibitors like finasteride and dutasteride. How they can be used to combat the side effects for those who do experience side effects. To now be putting out videos that post-finasteride syndrome doesn't exist, but to have previously made videos regarding the use of erectogenic drugs to aid in the sexual side effects that come with finasteride is a complete 
invalidating contradiction, which should make any onlooker think twice about accepting the information that comes out of the Hair Cafe YouTube channel. On a video that I posted refuting the notion that DHT is a trash hormone, as well as a follow-up video exploring the effects of DHT on penile tissue, erection quality, libido, as well as ejaculatory reflexes, my channel was bombarded by some of Hair Cafe's cult followers, executing a large degree of ad hominem and out of context attacks to me, my channel, and the scientific viewpoint that DHT is important for male sexual function. I have been on finasteride for over 30 years with no side effects. My arms are bigger than yours even with low DHT, and I am not so insecure. I need to wear a skimpy t-shirt to prove my masculinity. Your only argument against someone being that they use a script, and then proceeding to use an AI-generated script as a scientific source. You honestly can't write this shit LMFAO. These types perpetuate a phenomenon we might call social proof gaslighting, where a collection of people that didn't have some effect from something discount the experiences of people that did. Admittedly, as I've said before, many men seem to be able to take finasteride and not run into side effects, likely due to DHT levels that are not fully bottomed out and or a genetic resilience in the brain and or at penile tissue to the devastating effects of DHT inhibition. These men rightfully praise the use of finasteride because for them, it changed their lives and gave them their hair back. And though many of them are likely quietly suffering from decreased libido and suboptimal erectile function, they are unlikely to vocalize the problems they've had with finasteride because of their stark opposition to the idea that finasteride can cause terrible side effects. But what's alarmingly pertinent about discerning the true cause of their internet trolling and persistent aggression should reflect us to a paper title. Testosterone downregulates the levels of androgen receptor mRNA in smooth muscle cells from the rat corpora cavernosa via aromatization to estrogens. I think here we're able to highlight perhaps one of the most important factors in this aggressive, hostile behavior and people like Kevin from Hair Cafe, as well as his cultish followers, in that when DHT formation is inhibited, the aromatization pathway of testosterone into estradiol will prevail and induce a pronounced market downregulation of androgen receptor mRNA levels in the penis. In short, aggressive, emotional, hostile behavior, which is presented in this contingent of people, as well as Kevin Mann himself, and what seems to be an endless array of picking fights with and attacking other YouTubers as a primary MO of the channel, may be the result of excessive aromatization of testosterone into estradiol via inhibiting the formation of dihydrotestosterone by using 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. But at the same time, as we discussed prior, the long-term inhibition of dihydrotestosterone's metabolites, namely 3-alpha androstenediol, are likely to cause a downregulation of the GABA-A receptor, or at the very least, prevent GABAergic mediation over other excitatory neurotransmitters. It is likely that in addition to excessive aromatization, which some individuals, including Kevin, believe is a good thing due to estrogen's positive effects on cardiac and brain health, but which becomes a problem in excess, a lack of inhibitory control over excitatory Predatory neurological mechanisms creates an environment conducive to aggression and irrationality. This group, including Kevin himself, cites extremely vague literature with arbitrary and confusing language, which will lead a less than inquisitive scientific brain to believe that 5-alpha reductase inhibitors do not cause sexual dysfunction in men. Let's take this paper, for example, titled The Effect of 5-Alpha Reductase Inhibitors on Erectile Function, in which the vague and confusing language, we conclude that 5-Alpha Reductase Inhibitors do not lead to erectile dysfunction to a significant degree, and we support the position that dihydrotestosterone is less relevant than testosterone in erectile function. The conclusion, however, does not say DHT is irrelevant it contends it is less relevant, implying that it is still relevant. The language, in my opinion, is particularly arbitrary and meant to be confusing in saying we conclude 5-alpha reductase inhibitors do not lead to erectile dysfunction to a significant degree. Define significant degree. Because from reading that, what it seems like you mean is they do cause erectile dysfunction, but in this small sample size you studied, because nocturnal erections didn't suffer all that much, that you can confidently conclude that 5-alpha reductase inhibitors do not cause sexual dysfunction? They go on to say, in order to evaluate the direct effect of 5-alpha reductase inhibitors on sexual life, investigators studied erectile function in patients taking these drugs. There was a sleep-related erection study design with the aim of measuring erectile function objectively during double-blind administration of finasteride or placebo. Their purpose was to find the answer to the question, does finasteride impair erectile function? 
Sleep-related erection studies provide objective measures of erection physiology and pathophysiology. Naturally occurring spontaneous episodes of nocturnal penile tumescence occur with consistent regularity during rapid eye movement sleep in all sexually potent men. 20 healthy, sexually active men were randomized to receive either placebo or 5 mg a day of finasteride for 12 weeks according to a double-blind study. Erection physiology was assessed by a polysomnography device. The investigators found that finasteride did not consistently suppress sleep-related erections compared with placebo. They explained that the most likely reason that finasteride did not impair erectile function was that it did not sufficiently inhibit 5-alpha reductase activity in critical areas of the brain. They acknowledge that DHT involvement in the maintenance of libido and potency is not excluded. In other words, in a mere 20 men for a mere 12 weeks, which may not be enough time for some people for sexual side effects to take hold, there wasn't consistent suppression of nocturnal erections. So there was suppression, but not consistent suppression. In these cases, it is likely that the full effect of starving the male body and penile tissues of DHT had not reached its full potential. An important part of this study, though, which may help to explain some of the resiliency in men taking finasteride that do not report sexual symptoms, is they explain that the most likely reason that finasteride did not impair erectile function was that it did not sufficiently inhibit 5-alpha reductase inhibitor in critical areas of the brain. They acknowledge that DHT involvement in the maintenance of libido and potency is not excluded. But what the study, and studies like it, fail to acknowledge is the intra penile blood flow dynamics that are directly affected by dihydrotestosterone and the lack of dihydrotestosterone. And interestingly, this direct obfuscation of the sexual side of DHT binding at the androgen receptors carries directly over to the pro finasteride extremists. What is often overlooked in how this hair cafe character makes his arguments is that there is actually an underlying implication that inhibiting DHT causes sexual dysfunction. By explaining that finasteride only inhibits up to 70% of DHT, Kevin Mann is actually making the argument that some DHT is necessary for male sexual function which is true. People like Kevin also conveniently leave out the topic of sexual function in explaining the results of giving exogenous testosterone to people taking finasteride and deflect to the notion that in such an example, men get anabolic testosterone benefits in this case. Also, we know from other studies that DHT is not necessary to treat men with symptoms of low T. We know this because if you give men with low T testosterone combined with a 5 air blocker like finasteride, you get the exact same results as when you give testosterone alone. For example, in this study here, older men with low T were randomized to receive a placebo, testosterone alone, or testosterone plus finasteride. The men on testosterone alone or testosterone plus finasteride had similar improvements in muscle strength, increases in lean muscle mass, and decreases in fat mass compared to placebo. A similar study of older hypogonadal men was published in 2012, this study right here specifically. In the study, men got testosterone with or without dutasteride at 2.5 milligrams per day. That's five times higher than the standard dose for dutasteride. Like the other study we just mentioned, dutasteride did not inhibit the effects of testosterone treatment in improving muscle strength and reducing fat mass. This of course makes sense. Testosterone's effect on the sexual system comes both from testosterone and its action on nitric oxide, androgen receptors in the brain, aromatization to estradiol, and subsequent neurosteroids, but its primarily androgenic or sexual effects come from the conversion to DHT. But testosterone's effect on anabolism comes from testosterone itself in the tissues. What Kevin sneakishly did that the non-inquisitive or non-scientific mind wouldn't catch is highlight that testosterone is anabolic even in the presence of a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. That is all he said. And that's true. That was never the argument. The argument is testosterone is less androgenic when it doesn't convert to DHT. And that androgenicity is what is lacking in users taking finasteride suffering from sexual disturbances. This is also why post-finasteride syndrome sufferers and men who have alterations in 5-alpha reductase metabolism often do not have resolution of their sexual symptoms on just exogenous testosterone alone. After all, if there's a genetic or otherwise impairment in 5-alpha reductase's action to convert testosterone into dihydrotestosterone, sexual symptoms will likely not fully resolve on testosterone replacement therapy alone. In these cases, there is insufficient dihydrotestosterone available to maintenance penile tissue and sexual function, and the primary pathway of metabolism of testosterone is into estradiol or estrogen. It is both the excessive estradiol and the lack of DHT that keeps sufferers in a sexually impaired state. 
DHT plays a critical role in antagonizing Estradiol's response in males, and without it, Estradiol can reign supreme, wreaking havoc on the male sexual system. Also, if DHT was a useless or trash hormone, as Hair Cafe and his followers contend, why would we continue 5-alpha-reducing testosterone into dihydrotestosterone into adulthood? It is far-fetched to believe that the male adult mistakenly continues to make DHT from testosterone, that somehow this ongoing process of reducing testosterone into its more powerful, more potent androgen, DHT, is a mistake that our bodies make. Now look, the body is perfectly capable of making mistakes, as evidenced by things like autoimmune disorders, among other things. But the continued reduction of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone and the continued function of the 5-alpha reductase enzymes, which mediate glucocorticoid and mineral corticoid activity, as well as their metabolites mediating neurological and GABAergic mechanisms, is not one of those mistakes. Kevin Mann from the Hair Cafe channel also tries to make the point that finasteride is more powerful in rats via the blockade of both 5-alpha reductase 1 and 5 of reductase 2. As with any rodent study, it's very important to remember that finasteride acts differently in rodents compared to humans. In human beings, finasteride is a strong blocker of the type 2 5-air isoenzyme, but it is also a very weak blocker of the type 1 5-air isoenzyme. In rats, however, finasteride blocks both isoenzymes very strongly. So in rats, finasteride is overall a much stronger 5-air blocker than it is in humans, so it will reduce DHT levels more in rats than it does in humans. Just this fact alone makes it very problematic to extrapolate the results of rat studies to humans. And that somehow because of that, humans are different and less likely to have a severe deficiency in DHT. But what he's really saying is, because the human 5-alpha reductase enzymes don't react as strongly to finasteride as rats do, there's ultimately less DHT reduction in humans compared to rats. Meaning, human males still retain some degree of their DHT while on finasteride. And while that isn't completely true because people respond to finasteride differently in this regard and will have far lower levels of DHT than a male that's DHT doesn't get bottomed out on finasteride, he indirectly proves the point that DHT is necessary for male sexual function. And even if there is a more exaggerated response in rats versus humans, this is actually completely irrelevant to the argument. It implies that you could not replicate the reduction in nitric oxide synthase and intracavernosal penile pressure in humans, which no study says, the study in question doesn't say, and is something that Kevin basically made up. The inhibition of DHT synthesis by 5-alpha reductase inhibitors will in some men reduce DHT to a catastrophic degree starving penile tissues of dihydrotestosterone-mediated transcription activity, which is proven by the finding that castrated rats treated with exogenous testosterone recovered erectile function, but when co-administered with a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor to block DHT production, this recovery was lost. The reason there was recovery in these rats with testosterone without a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor was via the conversion of testosterone into dihydrotestosterone. When you administer testosterone with a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, you get erectile-impaired rats that are still erectile impaired. And again, Merck's own drug label warning on finasteride regarding erectile dysfunction proves hair cafe and similar post-finasteride syndrome deniers wrong. The entirety of the argument that studies performed and thus outcomes created in rats are not extrapolable to humans is nil. The sole reason that rats are used for studies are their remarkable anatomical, genetic, and physiological similarities compared to humans. But in a research paper titled simply Finasteride, the following statement is made. Research has shown that finasteride reduces prosthetic DHT levels by upwards of 90% and serum DHT levels by 70%. However, increasing the dose does not necessarily result in greater serum DHT reduction. This renders the argument that because rats are more sensitive to 5-alpha reductase inhibition's deleterious effects on penile erection, nil. Again, Kevin made that up and try to sneakishly sway unsuspecting non-scientific people that won't dive into the literature and discern what he's really saying into believing that rats fed finasteride in higher doses, that the negative erectogenic effects of finasteride on rats was due to the fact that they metabolize finasteride differently. But this paper tells us that increasing the dose of finasteride does not necessarily result in greater serum DHT reduction. Again, Kevin made it up, and this is among the many reasons that him and people like him deemed post-finasteride syndrome deniers are dangerous. So rats are, scientifically speaking, very much in play regarding comparisons to humans in relation to 5-alpha reductase inhibitors and their effect on erectile physiology. 
And by the way, many more rat studies have been done regarding 5-alpha reductase inhibitors and erectile dysfunction. This study, titled The Effects of Chronic 5-Alpha Reductase Inhibitor Dutasteride Treatment on Rat Erectile Function, goes like this. Numerous clinical series have reported an association between 5-alpha reductase inhibitors and sexual dysfunction, but there are limited preclinical data available. The aim was to further investigate the mechanisms of erectile dysfunction related to 5-alpha reductase inhibitor therapy using a rat model. And here were the results. Mean serum DHT was suppressed by 86.5% after 30 days of 5-alpha reductase inhibitor treatment and was statistically significant. In vivo, erectile response in the dutasteride-treated group decreased significantly compared with control. While electrical field stimulation-induced and acetylcholine-induced relaxation was decreased, EFS-induced and phenylephrine-induced adrenergic contraction was significantly enhanced in the dutasteride group. These studies demonstrated increased collagen deposition in the treatment arm as well as altered expression of neuronal nitric oxide synthase and inducible nitric oxide synthase. Conclusions The 5-alpha reductase inhibitors as demonstrated in these rat cavernosal smooth muscle studies have a detrimental effect on erectile function. Enhanced inducible nitric oxide synthase expression may protect penile smooth muscle tissue from fibrosis. The effect of 5-alpha reductase inhibitors on human sexual function warrants further investigation. Now look, if finasteride inhibits DHT production in humans up to 70%, that is a mere 16.5% difference from the DHT suppression in rats in the prior stated study, which is not a significant difference in total DHT suppression. This is actually the crux of the issue. post finasteride syndrome deniers like Kevin Mann from Hair Cafe contend that because the reduction of DHT in humans doesn't exceed 70%, therefore leaving some DHT in the body, this is the reason that him and people like him do not get sexual dysfunction on finasteride. But what he's really saying is, which is actually true, is that finasteride inhibits DHT conversion to an extent in humans, allowing some of those humans to retain physiological DHT concentration enough to maintain sexual function. Since there are vast differences in the way that humans respond to the inhibition of testosterone's reduction to dihydrotestosterone, the difference between men that do get sexual dysfunction from finasteride and men that don't likely simply lies in the amount of DHT that is inhibited or not inhibited in these individuals. If DHT is inhibited to an extent enough to slow hair loss and even help some hair regrow, but not inhibited to the extent that it causes erectile impairment, that can be considered considered somewhat of a win. And individuals with these experiences are likely to develop a pro-finasteride bias, defending its use in all humans. But not everyone is this lucky. And it's the closed-mindedness mixed with the bias of their own N equals one experiences that fools pro-finasteride zealots into believing that everyone will react the same way that they do to the drug. And this is not true. In science, there is a well-known phenomenon called inter-individual variability, which explains ancestral and genetic variations in how humans respond to, in terms of pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, pharmaceutical drugs. And the medical establishment and medicine as an industry is in the early stages of implementing more of an individual-based set of treatment plans for drugs to account for the individual variability in response to pharmacological agents. In a paper titled Sources of Inter-Individual Variability, the authors conclude, for drug metabolism enzymes, genetic variation can result in the complete absence or enhanced expression of a functional enzyme. In addition, upregulation and downregulation of gene expression in response to an altered cellular environment can achieve the same range of metabolic function, but often in a less predictable and time-dependent manner. Understanding the mechanistic basis for variability in drug disposition and response is essential if we are to move beyond the era of empirical, trial and error, dose selection into the age of personalized medicine that will improve outcomes in maintaining health and treating diseases. What is very clear in doing a comprehensive analysis of the vast array of publicly available data on finasteride in rodents as well as humans and comparing that data to the seemingly innumerable amounts of reports of sexual dysfunction from the use of finasteride and other 5-alpha reductase inhibitors is that there is individual variability in the responses to these drugs both in terms of serum DHT reduction but also regarding ancestral underpinnings, composition of the microbiome, but importantly a newly coined term called pharmacogenetics, which explores the genetic differences between the metabolism and thus the effect of drugs between humans. To exclude the notion of differences between responses to drugs by humans and assume that all humans will respond the same way that you do to a drug and then shaming, guilting, 
publicly attacking and markedly discounting the experiences of people that respond negatively to a drug that you respond positively to is nothing short of dangerous. Post finasteride syndrome is real and is characterized by muting of the male libido, genital anesthesia, severe erectile dysfunction, and neurological disturbances that significantly reduce the quality of life in affected individuals. This isn't a controversial topic anymore. This is a topic wherein some individuals, for reasons related to their bias toward the drug that helped them, as well as their propensity to chase social clout on the internet, refuse to publicly admit that the drug they praise as being free of causing sexual and mental health symptoms does in fact cause these collection of symptoms in men. And we have a name for these collections and symptoms, and it's called post finasteride syndrome. For those men that are suffering with PFS, I feel you, I hear you, I understand you, I read your posts, I feel your troubles, and I sympathize greatly. I am terribly sorry that to some degree, the makers of Finasteride, as well as a small uh, vocal contingent of misguided internet zealot extremists, discount your real life experiences. But I know that it's real, and you know that it's real. And many medical professionals who refuse to prescribe the drug to their patients also know that it's real. And while underground, there have been many instances of full symptom resolution by enhancing the conversion of testosterone into dihydrotestosterone or using DHT derivatives in conjunction with various hormone replacement therapy protocols. And, and in some cases, uh, extreme protocols detailing the use of things like sodium valparate. What I would suggest is approaching recovery with an open mind, but most importantly, never give up. If it was done, it can be undone. I appreciate the time that you've taken to watch this documentary. And I can assure you that there is more to be discussed about this topic. This is merely but a part one to what will likely be a long series explaining the deleterious physiological effects of 5-alpha reductase inhibitors on both the sexual function and the mental health of human males. And with that, good luck, Godspeed, and I thank you for your time.